Hey everybody, uh, this is Data Gathering Techniques. This is uh, 20.1. We're just going to spend one day on this section here. So the part two, or 20.2, we'll spend two or three days on. So under what circumstances should a sample statistic be used as an estimator of a population parameter? Okay, and so um, this whole, we're doing statistics now, the unit 20. So um, uh, it's a fun, easy kind of easy scoring, data gathering, number crunching in a calculator sort of uh, module. So hopefully you guys have calculated for this. So so data gathering techniques. So here's some various uh, sampling methods. So a simple random sample is when each individual of the population has an equal chance of being selected. A self-selected sample is when individuals volunteer to be part of a sample. A convenient sample is um, uh, when individuals are selected based on how accessible easy, or easy they are. So for example, if you selected people uh, at the mall, that was, that's a nice convenient sample right there because there's people coming into the mall. So uh, a systematic sample uh, is when members of the, the sample are chosen according to a rule. So like say there's a thousand people and you chose every fifth person in that population. Okay, so Stratified sample is when the population is divided into groups and individuals from each group are selected, typically through a random sample for it within the groups. A cluster sample is when the population is divided into groups <clears throat> and then uh, some of the groups are randomly selected and either all of the individuals from the selected groups are selected or just some of the individuals from the selected groups are selected. And this is typically through a random sample within each selected group. So these are pretty close, you guys, except sometimes we take the whole group here. Um, and then, uh, so uh, anyways, we'll talk about that with some examples here. So identify the population, classify the sampling method, and decide whether the sampling methods could result in some bias. And then so uh, uh, explain. So uh, just so we can save some time on writing here, because so we've already done a lot in my class. So these come from example 1A on page 1039. So the officials of the NFL want to know how the players feel about some proposed changes to the NFL rules. They decide to ask a sample of 100 people. Okay, so here's the first one. So the officials choose the first 100 players who volunteer their opinion. Well, that one would be uh, the self-selected sample because they're volunteering their, opinion, their opinions. And this could result in bias um, uh, because uh, the players who feel strongly about the rules would be the first one to volunteer for their opinions, okay? So, um, you know, like if you go to a restaurant and they have a suggestion box, well, most of the time, people who make suggestions are those that uh, didn't have a good time. So it's very biased that way. So um, they're volunteering their suggestions. So anyway, so the officials, here's number two. The officials randomly choose three or four players from each of the 32 teams. Okay, this would be the stratified sample because the players are selected by a team and randomly chosen from each of those teams. This is not likely to be biased since the players are chosen randomly and are taken from each team, okay? Here we go. The officials uh, have a computer randomly generate a list of 100 players from a database of all NFL players. All right, this is a simple random sample because each player has an equally likely chance of being chosen. This is not likely to be biased since the players are chosen at random right here. Okay, so... This one's example 1B, and so this talks about lunch. So administrators at a school want to know if students think that a more vegetarian item should be added to their lunch menu. So, so the administrators survey every 25th student who enters the cafeteria at lunch. Well, this is a systematic sample because the rule of every 25th student is used. So uh, this method is not likely to be biased because a wide range of students will be surveyed that way. How about this? The administrators uh, survey the first 50 students who get in the lunch line to buy lunch. Well, this one is a convenient sample because the students are easily accessible. And the, this method is usually um, uh, biased because in this case, it doesn't include those students who bring their, uh, bring their own lunches. Okay. How about this? The administration uses a randomly generated list of 50 students from their master list of all students. Well, this is a simple random sample because each student has an equally likely chance of being selected. This method is not likely to be biased because the students are chosen at random. All right, so when making predictions with data, it can be a numerical thing such as a length, the heights, the salaries, member mean, median, mode, 
standard deviation. That's all in the next lesson. Those are numerical uh, data things. So it could be categorical, such as eye color, gender, or political affiliation, something like that. So something that's not numbered. Typically, if you can average it, you guys, it's called a numerical one. If you can't average it, then it's a categorical one. And often we use proportions for categorical data showing uh, the relative frequency. So a proportion is, you know, how many of them are red out of the total or something like that. Okay, so here's an example on example two on page uh, 1040. Okay, so let's uh, just read that one at a time. So here's this. So a community health center surveyed a small random sample of adults in the community about their exercise habits. The survey asked whether the person engaged in regular cardio exercise, running, walking, swimming, or other, and if so, what the duration and the frequency of the exercise was. And so of the 25 people, so this is going to be important right here, so of the 25 people surveyed, 10 said that they do engage in a regular cardio exercise. So the table lists the data for these 10 people. Calculate the statistics from the sample and then use the statistics to make predictions about exercise habits of the approximately, there's approximately 5,000 adults that live in that community. Okay, so here's, here's our, our data right here. So these are of the 10 of the 25 people that said uh, that they do some kind of cardio exercise right here. Okay, so let's calculate. This one's a two, two banger here, so a two question here. Calculate the proportion of adults who get regular cardio exercise and the proportion of runners who get regular cardi cardio exercise. Okay, so remember it said there's 25 people that were surveyed and 10 said they do engage in regular cardio exercise. So that would be 10 out of 25 or 0.40 or 40 percent I forgot to put that on there you might want to put uh, or 40 percent okay so 40 percent so either one okay all right so um, uh, and then uh, let's calculate uh, uh, let's see it said calculate the proportion of runners who get regular cardio exercise well of the cardio people there's 10 of them that said they do and so how many were runners so here's a runner one two three four there's five runners of these 10. So of the people who get cardio, um, it's five out of 10, so 50%, okay, or 0 0.50, okay? So uh, let's see. So now use the proportion above uh, to predict the number of runners among all adults living in the community, okay? So what we have to do is recognize there's 5,000 people living in the community right here. So we can predict this by multiplying the number of adults in the community with the proportion of adults who get regular cardio exercise. So that would be this 40%, okay, or, or 0 0.40. And then uh, uh, of those, uh, of that 40%, half of those guys um, uh, are runners right there. So what we're going to do is um, uh, take that 5,000 people, multiply it by 40%, and then multiply it times 50%, and so that's going to get us that um, 1,000. So about 1,000 people do get that right there, okay? All right, so calculate each. The mean duration of exercise for those who get regular cardio exercise, okay? So the mean duration. So what we got to do is add all these up and divide it by... 10. So 480 divided by 10 is 48 minutes. Okay, that was in minutes. What's the mean frequency of exercise for those who get regular cardio? Okay, so what we got to do now is here's the frequency, the number of times per week. We're going to add that up and divide it by 10. So it's 37 divided by 10 is 3.7. So now use that to predict the number of hours spent uh, exercising each week of those who get regular cardio. So what we're going to do now is um, uh, this is going to be the average time spent times the number of times each week, okay? And then we want to know, um, uh, change that to hours. It says the number of hours. So at the end, we multiply it by one hour per 60 minutes right there, okay? So we just divide it by 60 to get us in hours right there, okay? So this will get us all an hour. So it's 48 minutes. That's the average time of these cardio people. And the average amount of times they do it is 3.7. So 48 times 3.7. And don't forget to divide it by 60 because then these minutes will cancel right there and we'd be left in hours so number of times per week uh, hours a week right there okay all right you guys I hope that makes sense and there's gonna be your assignment take care